Mr. President of the Republic, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me first of all thank you for inviting me to this inspiring occasion and conference. However, after having listened to the President of the Republic, in particular on the role of rule of law in our European construction, having heard about the cultural basis of the European integration, which is unity in diversity, not least in cultural diversity. I'm a little bit lost now to talk about loans and guarantees and funds, in particular at a time when we approach these issues when it comes to Greece only with crisis scenarios. And normally only are highly concentrated on macroeconomic considerations and monetary policy. While the role of the bank, which I have the honor to chair, is to deal with the real economy. And I'll come back to that later on because that gives me the opportunity to, to paint a somewhat more positive picture than is normally painted by foreign visitors when they come to Greece and talk about the economy. But let me begin with a, and I put my, my script aside because I was more inspired by these speeches, so I would rather make a couple of remarks from the bottom of my heart on this. Um, well, the, uh, obviously, we live in, in crazy times, in times of uncertainty, incredible uncertainty, which for a bank is crucial and dangerous. We live in times where we feel there is a certain return of realities that we thought would belong to a distant past. Uh, and obviously, we also have a clear or apparent lack of clear objectives and common principles so maybe, indeed, Mario, our journey to, to Delphi, uh, our consultations and discussions here may prove as necessary and hopefully as reassuring as the ones carried out by our ancestors many centuries ago and hopefully also uh, appropriately um, phrased. Ladies and gentlemen, when we, find, when we celebrate this month the 60th anniversary of the European Union, uh, we go back to a time when truly visionary leaders began to unite the European countries economically and politically, and the success story is enormous. I do not want to repeat all this. The problem is we take all this for granted. And uh, we do not, we are not always aware of what kind of value we have in our hands there. And this is a good and a bad story because for my children it is wonderful that they can all take all this for granted. However, there are very good reasons to be a little bit more cautious, and we should warn them about this. When citizens seem to be ridden by doubts, the European project all of a sudden seems threatened by a lack of self-confidence, and that leads to populism rising every day. And obviously, we need to address this disconnect that we can observe in many countries between political leaders and the people on the ground, not only because of political, legal, and social developments, but also because of a technological development in which communication takes place in a completely different way. I've been sitting in parliament for 25 years, and since I wasn't very successful at the beginning, it took me 35 years of campaigning for parliamentary representation. So I've been, gone th I've been going through decades of, of election campaigns, and for the first time five years ago, the internet and social media played a crucial role, but far not the way it is today the case. But reaching people with our great European message in social media where people are hidden in their social prejudice-driven resonance rooms where normally a discourse does not take place but a mutual confirmation of individual prejudice, it is very difficult to get the messages across and to give it some intellectually appropriate fundament. In his last State of the Union speech, President Obama said, and I quote, progress is not inevitable. It is the result of choices we make together. And we face such choices right now. Will we respond to the changes of our time with fear turning inward as nations? Or will we face the future with confidence in who we are and what we stand for?" End of quote. I believe this is exactly 
the right message for the Europeans today, now that American leaders do not listen to this president anymore. More than ever, it's the moment to demonstrate what Europe stands for, what its values are, and also what are the benefits of European Union membership. Ladies and gentlemen, to tackle some of the challenges our continent faces and to reconnect the European project with its citizens, we have to find the right balance, and that is the piece of art number one in the European construction from the beginning, the balance between subsidiarity and solidarity. And we have a problem of identifying it and balancing out again and again. We are a community of law, as we have so clearly been reminded of today. At the same time, the unity in diversity is the key principle of the European integration. And it is almost a little banal to talk about economics in this context. But let us not forget, without the economy, the European integration process would not have been so successful. So it is legitimate to talk a few words about the economic situation as well. And there, ladies and gentlemen, we have to take a serious fact into consideration. We have never had an economic crisis out of which we have moved as slowly as is the case this time. The return to the growth path, the increase of productivity is so slow or even non-existent that we can say we have never observed this before, neither in North America nor in Europe. And this is something of serious concern for all of us. And that has happened at a time, and maybe there is a causal link, where we have been inward looking for 10 years now. Since the beginning of the financial crisis, Europe has been looking inward. And that has led to a reduction also of the level of confidence with which we approach our challenges. And it also has led to a neglect of the progress that other parts of the world have made. And I believe this is something that we must address. It is not an economic luxury to talk about these things. It is an absolute necessity to see and identify that and why are we so far behind when it comes to the digital economy in Europe. Why we are so far behind when it comes to developing to delivering on the key objective of the Treaty of, Europe, of the Economic Community. It was to f form a common market and to level out differences between regions. The, the Mezzogiorno was at the core of the founding of the economic community, and still the Mezzogiorno is a case of great concern in the European Union. And the same is true for other regions as well, but even more. We are so proud of having produce this wonderful huge market, more or less common internal market. Ladies and gentlemen, it covers 50% of our EU GDP, not more. The rest is still produced along the lines of national or regional reg uh, regulation. And when it comes to the digital economy, where in the United States we are dealing with a huge market, fully integrated, same procedures, same rules everywhere, and we compare it to the problems that we have on the border between Alsace and Virginia, between France and Germany, when it comes to the digital realities, we see how much we still have to do. And in this very situation, we address the questions of the investment gap in Europe. When we gave Mr. Juncker the advice on the investment plan for Europe a couple of years ago, uh, we identified on a very solid basis an investment gap in Europe of annually 700 billion euros with his plan, we have been able, very successfully, to reduce that by 100 million per year. So we are far away from delivering on this challenge. And since we adopted, or the European Parliament and Council adopted the Juncker Plan, we have subscribed to Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, and we have subscribed to COP21 and the Climate Goals of the World Community. And that has, of course, widened the investment gap considerably. So it is worthwhile to go deeper into these analyses, and that is essential at the entry into the fourth industrial revolution, which I think has been addressed very, very clearly in Davos several times now, and has not been taken up by those who are responsible for that. I will not go further into details, also because I'm aware that um, we have already used a lot of time, but let me say at the end of the day, one word on Greece and our activities here. 
We talk about Europe when we talk about the EIB. The EIB is the EU bank. And the EU bank was in this country from the first day of deliberations of one day becoming a member of the European Economic Community. And the EIB was here, of course, before the financial crisis. And we were the bank, multilateral bank, which stayed during the crisis and expanded during the crisis. And we are still there, and we are still here, and we are expanding. And we are dealing with the real economy. And that is what is so encouraging about this country. Because some people in the North might believe that uh, intellectual or industrial creativity is something that would not happen here. It does happen here. And that must be supported. That must be strengthened, because that gives the spirit and the dynamism of an economy that will have a chance to grow. I'm convinced of that completely. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now responsible in our balance, with our balance sheet for 10% of Greece's GDP. The overall accumulated lending here leads to that figure. And that shows that the European Union is taken at least a part of the responsibility <laughs> that needs to be taken in the spirit of the balance between solidarity and subsidiarity that I've talked about before. I go always to Greece and I go here very frequently because that's our key challenge for the stability of the European Union. Uh, and I return home with more optimism than concerns or doubts. And sometimes it is important to say that. We must, however, be more open-minded. We must be more open-minded, not only for Greece, but for the entire European Union, when it comes to the more intelligent use of the budget. The president of the high-level group, whom we have just heard, has made proposals for the revenue side, on the expenditure side of the budget, some creativity enhancing measures can be possible as well. The Juncker plan is one of these measures that can be expanded, that can be expanded to agriculture, that can be expanded to development policies. So I think uh, there is no limit to creativity in this field. We, we must do that, but basically I believe we are on the, right, on the right track, but we must explain to our people that with the improvements that are happening and that are taking place, Europe definitely has something to do. Otherwise, we might play into the hands of those who have explicit, explicitly or implicitly the objective of reducing the importance or even destroying this European integration process. On that basis, I welcome very much that Jean-Claude Juncker has pre presented the white paper yesterday. He has not produced, so to speak, results or final proposals. He has given us options about which we must think. We must probably elaborate on this or that. But I think it is very good that he forces the nation le nation's leaders to sh take their share of responsibility and take ownership for the European project. Because one thing must stop. The idea that everything that works in this European Union is due to ingenuity and geniality of our national political leaders. And everything that might go wrong is due to the bureaucrats in Brussels. This division of labor does not work. And secondly, when leaders return from the European councils, would they please stop making press conferences and selling the people their successes, which are, of course, at the same time, the losses of the other side? If we don't believe anymore in the project of the European Union as a... Um, win-win situation, if we depict it as a, a zero-sum game all the time, then we have lost. I heard a very, very brilliant speech this week in Luxembourg, in our bank, when I invited Mario Monti to report about his findings as chairman of the High Level Group on, on Resources. And he gave the wonderful picture, which I might repeat. I cite you, so it's, it's intellectually okay. And he said, when I was prime minister, we went to these sometimes boring, never-ending European councils day and night, but at least everybody brought a brick, and we left it in Brussels. And after many, many European councils, these bricks had been formed into a wonderful building. Nowadays, everybody wants to take something out of the house, and this is something that will destroy the Union. So it is also a question of spirit in which we approach the issues of the future integration process and its acceptability by our citizens. Thank you very much.